Greetings, and welcome to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and I'm glad to have you with me today for another discussion of military, or in this case, naval, history. Today, the Navy we'll be talking about will be the American one, specifically the Asiatic fleet of the 1920s and 30s. These were the representatives and enforcers of American interests in the region, and were the successors of the squadrons that had maintained an American presence in these waters since the days immediately following the Revolution. This collection of blue water ships and riverine craft were most often engaged, like the naval squadrons of the other naval powers in the region, in the protection of their country's citizens in those areas, as well as the commercial and political interests of the nation as a whole. I'm going to focus predominantly on the activities in China up to the Shanghai Crisis of 1932, because I believe this not only illustrates the legacy of 19th century gunboat diplomacy in the region, but also because it seems to me to be one of the last manifestations of the kind of quasi-imperial relations that existed between the Western powers and China before the Second World War transformed the situation there entirely. My sources for this one will be The U.S. Navy, A History, by Nathan Miller. This is an official account published by the Naval Institute Press. I'll also be drawing from a summary compiled by the Naval Heritage and History Command, found on history.navy.mil. Titled Yangtze River Patrol in the U.S. Navy Asiatic Fleets in China, 1920-1942, this summary consists of material drawn from the annual reports of the Navy Department. Finally, I'll also use an article, The Decline of Overseas Station Fleets, the United States Asiatic Fleet in the Shanghai Crisis, 1932, by Stephen F. Roberts. This article I found in the Center for Naval Analysis's professional paper number 20, wherein it was reprinted from an original in the American Neptune, volume 37, number 3. Once again, I'd like to apologize in advance for the terrible pronunciation of some of the place names or ship names that I will certainly present you with, as well as possible use of outdated place names. I'm not as familiar as I would like to be with the present day nations that exist in the area the world we'll be discussing today, and I'm using some old sources. So some of the places I may mention may have changed their names in the intervening century or in the course of decolonization. So with that out of the way, let's go back to the turn of the 19th century, to the South Seas and the Far East, where in scenes that inspired the work of Joseph Conrad, tall ships ply the distant waters in pursuit of the dangerous, but very lucrative trans-Pacific trade. American merchant vessels had been active in the Far East ever since before the Revolution. Not long after, in 1801, at a time when the port of Canton was the only Chinese city in which traders from the West were welcome, 34 ships flying the Stars and Stripes called there. Much of the American trade with China at this point was either in pelts obtained in the North Pacific coast, or aromatic sandalwood from the Hawaiian Islands. American naval vessels made sporadic appearances in the region beginning in 1819. The first recorded dispatch of an American ship of war to the western Pacific area on a specific mission was in 1831, when the 44-gun frigate Potomac was sent to Sumatra in response to the murder of some Americans among the crew of the New England trading vessel Friendship. Disguising a ship as a Danish merchantman, the American captain, John Downs, having failed to obtain satisfaction from the local leader at Kuala Batu, landed a force of 282 marines and sailors and attacked the town, capturing three forts defending it. The local leader, responsible for the deaths of the Americans, was killed in the fighting, along with about 150 of his men. His mission accomplished, Downs returned to American waters. Missions of this kind, intended to punish actions against American lives or property, and to instill a sense of fear and respect for the American flag, were the essence of what would eventually be called gunboat diplomacy. This kind of use of force and protection of national interests was an essential element of Navy activity in this time. As the force embodied in European and American warships and weapons increased throughout the Steam Age, the overwhelming power they came to represent made them a powerful instrument of intimidation and control. A crucial aspect of this kind of military and naval activity, then, is that it is pursued with limited means against an adversary with a comparatively weak military potential. An enemy with similar means of resistance could not be subjected to these kind of punitive actions. For this reason, these actions were not generally considered to constitute warfare per se, but are closer to police actions. The clear power disparity involved, then, makes these low-intensity conflicts less wars between rival nations than measures of control over territories held in some degree of subjection by an imperial power. The American instruments of this policy were formally brought into being in the 1830s. The United States East India Squadron was officially constituted three years after the cruise of the Potomac. At this time it was made up of the USS Peacock, a sloop of war, and a schooner, the USS Enterprise. By 1842 the squadron had expanded to include the frigates Constellation and Boston, 
One of the first missions of the East India Squadron, which came into being while the area was convulsed with the Opium War, was to act against the illegal smuggling of this substance into China. This created a favorable impression on the Chinese, and when the U.S. commander, Commodore Lawrence Kearney, learned that the British had extorted a treaty opening certain Chinese ports to their trade, he acted to secure similar concessions for the Americans. This led to an American most favored nation status in trade relations with the Chinese, and laid the groundwork for the eventual conclusion of a formal trade agreement between the two countries in 1845. This mission of protecting and supporting American commerce would remain one of the primary missions of the American Navy in the region throughout the rest of the 19th century and into the 20th, with political considerations, aside from the routine showing of the flag, a secondary function. This mission profile would persist into the 1930s, as we shall see, when the rise of a powerful Japanese presence in the region substantially altered the situation. The military potential of the squadron was exercised not infrequently to assert American power in the region. The Far East of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, like many other areas of the world at the time, was lawless and dangerous to a degree that we who live in more ordered and overseen times might be able to imagine. The capricious acts of local authorities and piracy, as well as ordinary crime, sometimes left the nationals of foreign nations exposed to violence or other depredations in the absence of the threat of force available to be used on their behalf. The provision of this protection to Americans was one of the more important peacetime missions of the ships of the various distant stations. The American naval presence would continue throughout the entire century, with only a brief hiatus in the 1860s, when the prosecution of the Civil War overrode all other considerations. The old East India Squadron would be replaced by the Asiatic Squadron, which was established in 1868. During this time, ships and marines of the squadron would respond to many other emergencies that endangered American or European lives, as well as exacting reprisals for crimes against Americans and insults to their flag. A prominent example of this kind of mission from the post-Civil War years was the expedition of Rear Admiral John Rogers against the Koreans in May of 1871. Some American vessels, including the merchant ship General Sherman, had been wrecked off the coast here, and the survivors apparently killed by the locals. Rogers arrived with five ships at the mouth of the Sali River, not far from Seoul, and demanded to speak with a high-ranking Korean official. The ships were led by the squadron flagship, the frigate Colorado, and included the sloops of war Benicia and Alaska, and the gunboats Monocacy and Palos. While waiting for the Koreans to arrive, his men were fired upon by the guns of a Korean fort and two men wounded. Still, the Admiral let ten days pass. When no apology or action in response to the murder of the shipwrecked Americans was forthcoming, Rogers ordered an amphibious attack on the forts guarding the approaches to the city. A vigorous assault was launched and 650 marines and sailors that landed made a determined attack against the strong points, supported by fire from the ship's batteries. Despite their outdated weaponry, which included matchlocks and other relics, the Koreans put up an extremely obstinate defense. The forts were taken on the 10th of June, but still the Koreans refused to treat with the Americans. They held out all throughout the month, and shortly after this time the approach of the typhoon season made it too dangerous for the American ships to remain in the area, and Rogers and his squadron withdrew on the 3rd of July. In the war against Spain in 1898, ships of the Asiatic Squadron under Admiral George Dewey destroyed the outdated Spanish fleet in the Battle of Manila Bay. In this action, the American ships, consisting of four cruisers and a few lighter warships led by the USS Olympia, sank eight enemy ships and brought an end to Spanish sea power in the east. Another Asiatic Squadron vessel, the protected cruiser Charleston, seized the island of Guam, which would later become one of the cornerstones of American power in the Pacific. During the rest of the conquest and pacification of the Philippines, the ships of this squadron, to which were added a number of captured Spanish gunboats, were active in assisting the army with shore bombardments and landing actions. In 1900, the Boxer Rebellion in China brought another emergency endangering the lives of Americans and other foreign citizens. The Asiatic Squadron formed part of the international naval expedition that rushed to the China coast to protect these endangered people. Sailors and Marines landed from the ships formed part of the relief force that landed at Tianjin, and advanced to the capital to relieve the siege of the foreign nationals holed up there. Shortly after this operation, in 1902, the Asiatic Squadron was redesignated United States Asiatic Fleet. The fleet appears to have played no prominent role in the First World War, during which all of its heavier ships were withdrawn to other theaters, leaving only a gunboat squadron to patrol the rivers in China and the Philippines. An enormous amount of advancement in the technology of naval ships and their armament had taken place in the meantime. The ships of the Asiatic fleet in the interwar period, while not necessarily the most advanced in the world, 
were light years ahead of the age of sail vessels such as the venerable frigate Constellation that had sailed for the East Indies Squadron. The rate of technological change in this period was accelerating generally, but in the field of naval construction, the new possibilities of the Industrial Age, combined with the military rivalries and fears of the great powers, create a situation in which huge sums of money must be invested in order to stay abreast of the changes happening elsewhere. This comparative availability of funding often caused the newest advances in the technological innovations of the day to make their first appearance in the naval services, and secondarily in the military service generally, where considerations of national or imperial security overrode those of profitability. The need to constantly improve your ships, no matter the cost, or to become fatally weaker than your rivals abroad led to the industrial nations groping towards the integration of high-tech industry and armed forces that would later become known as the military-industrial complex. This also produced what was probably the first international arms race in modern times. Perhaps the most consequential development was the most obvious one, the application of mechanical power to ship propulsion. The primitive steam engines of the early 1800s were gradually refined and made more reliable, compact, and efficient. The difficult to maintain reciprocating engines were eventually brought to their highest development in the vertical triple expansion engine. The reciprocating engine itself was to yield to the much more reliable and efficient steam turbine towards the end of the century. Coal-fired boilers of comparatively crude design were replaced with the safer and more efficient water tube boilers. Engine power was initially employed to drive large paddle wheels in order to drive the ship, but this was abandoned as underwater screws and reduction gearing systems were refined, providing a much more efficient and controllable, as well as a less vulnerable, method of propulsion. The fuel these ships used also transitioned from coal to coal sprayed with oil to exclusively oil-burning systems, although coal burners were still pretty common at the end of the century. The displacement of sail power by steam power led to much greater tactical potential of warships, as well as much more predictability in their sailing schedules and that of ships in general, as it would no longer be at the mercy of winds and tides. However, the new paradigm also led to new limitations on naval strategy, as the sailing ships had not had significant range limitations. The need to provide fuel for ships in distant parts of the world led the naval powers to seek bases in strategic areas for the refueling and servicing of the newer, more powerful, but also much shorter-legged ships. Ship construction also radically changed in this period, as advances in metallurgy and naval architecture produced iron and steel-hulled vessels. The ships of this kind were much stronger and could be made considerably larger than the older wooden vessels. The same advances in metalworking created altogether new alloys and steels which made possible the armoring of these bigger ships. The new steels and armor formulations were the objects of intensive development by the industrial powers, and the actual compositions of the various kinds of armor used were often closely guarded state secrets. The increase in speed and protection of these new ships also called for a new kind of firepower. The experience of the ironclad ships of the American Civil War, which seemed to be all but immune to contemporary naval cannon, led to the creation of new seaborne weapons. The traditional weapon, the gun, was transformed out of all recognition by the advances in engineering taking place. The naval cannon of the preceding centuries had been relatively small, short-ranged, inaccurate, and fired solid round shot. The new guns were capable of ranges 10 times or more of that of the old cannon. Range and power would be extended enormously as the century wore on until huge guns capable of throwing shells weighing hundreds if not thousands of pounds for many miles were created. Further, these guns fired shells packed with explosives, which were exponentially more destructive than the old solid cannonballs, especially to unarmored vessels. The vast increase in gun power, coupled with the long ranges involved in the lower rates of fire of these earlier types of guns, would create formidable problems of stabilization and fire control that would take decades to solve. This would be only one of the problems which would change the duties of the ordinary sailor from those of a manual laborer to those of a skilled technician. Guns were familiar at least, and though the changes they brought to naval warfare with their phenomenal advances in power and range were sizable, they were extensions of existing problems. Altogether new weapons were coming into use on the sea, however, to which conventional naval thinking had no answer. The self-propelled torpedo and the sea mine began the process of making naval warfare a three-dimensional problem, and the advent of submarines and aircraft would eventually bring about a challenge to the utility of the large warship itself and require a total revision of the strategy and tactics of war on the seas. This very brief rundown of new technologies barely scratches the surface. To cite a few examples offhand, the new techniques of hydraulic and electrically driven machinery, refrigeration, radio communications, and precision optics would radically change the equation of naval power, requiring constant innovation and improvement on the part of naval personnel. This process, which began sometime in the 1840s, has not yet ceased and is unlikely to do so.
The application of all these advances produced ships with firepower and capabilities far beyond those of the old wooden sailing frigates. The very rapid pace of these advances led to an uneven application of these new technologies to the ships that were produced. Let's take a brief look at the kind of ships that the Americans were using in the Western Pacific after the First World War came to a close. In 1920, the Asiatic fleet was made up of 26 vessels. The flagship Huron was one of three cruisers, along with the New Orleans and the Albany. Eight destroyers were also present, six of which were organized into Destroyer Division 13, comprising the ships Tarbell, Yarnall, Upshur, Greer, Elliott, and Lee. The other two, the Hart and Rizal, were detailed for mine laying duties. The Yangtze River Patrol consisted of eight gunboats, the Wilmington, Helena, Manakasi, Palos, Elcano, Villalobos, Quiros, and Pampanga. The last four of these were ex-Spanish vessels captured in the 1898 war. In addition to these fighting vessels, there were seven auxiliaries, the General Alava, Pompey, Abarenda, Ajax, Sarah Thompson, Genesee, and Piscataqua. The Huron was a Pennsylvania-class armored cruiser, commissioned in 1908 as the South Dakota. Her name was changed in June of 1920, after the ship had joined the Asiatic Squadron, so that her name could be transferred to one of the new dreadnought battleships. The Pennsylvanias were authorized at the turn of the century. They were considerably larger than the preceding American armored cruisers, but they were somewhat undergunned compared to foreign ships of their size. In this, they were typical of American ships of the last decade of the 19th century, the guns of which were often inferior to their European counterparts. The Huron carried a total of 16 coal-fired boilers, which provided steam to a pair of vertical triple expansion engines, developing 23,000 horsepower. This was sufficient to drive the 15,000-ton machine to a maximum speed of 22 knots. Carrying a full load of 2,000 tons of coal and sailing at an economical cruising speed of 10 knots, she could travel 5,000 nautical miles without refueling. Like other armored cruisers, the area covered by her armored protection was limited to the command and machinery spaces of the ship, as well as the gun's magazines. While the protection reached, it was substantial. Maximum thickness of the belt armor was 152 millimeters at the waterline, with slightly more protecting the main battery and the command post. Her main armament consisted of four 8-inch or 203 millimeter 42 caliber guns mounted in two twin turrets. Secondary battery, mounted in broadside casemates, included 14 6-inch or 152 millimeter guns and 18 3-inch or 76 millimeter pieces. Her armament was rounded out by 12 47 millimeter rapid fire guns and a pair of torpedo tubes on the beam. Huron was manned by just over 900 officers and men. Before her service in the Far East, during the First World War, she had been active in the South Atlantic with three of her sister ships. She arrived in Manila in late October 1919 to serve as the flagship for the Asiatic Squadron. The protected cruisers New Orleans and Albany were the only two ships of the New Orleans class. Both had been started in British yards in the last years of the 19th century as part of a four-ship class built for the Brazilian Navy. They were purchased while building by the Americans on the eve of the Spanish-American War. They were examples of the so-called Ellswick Cruiser, an early type built by the British for several foreign navies. According to the naval terminology of the day, protected cruisers differed from armored cruisers by their lack of an armored belt along the sides of the ship. Said, the principal protection consisted of an armored deck inside the vessel, covering the machinery spaces, along with an armored command post or citadel, and some protection for the guns. The batteries of these ships consisted of six 6-inch six guns, three forward and three aft, and four 4.7-inch guns in broadside casement mounts, as well as ten 57mm 6-pounder rapid-fire weapons. In addition, the cruisers carried four Maxim-type machine guns and three torpedo tubes. They were propelled by vertical triple expansion engines burning coal, and could make a speed of perhaps 20 knots. The USS Yarnall, like the rest of the destroyers then serving with the Asiatic Squadron, was a Wicks class vessel. She was commissioned at the end of November 1918, just too late to take part in the Great War. She was a typical American 1,200-ton flush deck four-stack design at a top speed of about 35 knots. She handled fairly well, but some of her topside positions would become quite wet at high speed, and the ship had a fairly short range. She was powered by two steam turbines fitted with reduction gears, driving two shafts and generating almost 25,000 horsepower. This oil-fired turbine power plant made her propulsion system among the most advanced American ships in the area. Her main armament consisted of four 4-inch or 102mm 50 caliber guns in single mounts, as well as a single 3-inch or 76mm 23 caliber dual-purpose weapon. 
torpedo armament was somewhat heavier than was typical, including four triple tube mounts on the broadside. A rack of depth charges was fitted aft, along with a Y gun for launching depth charge patterns. She carried a crew of 100 officers and men. The Yarn Hall would serve on the Asiatic Squadron until 1922, when she would return to the U.S. and be placed in an active reserve. In 1940, she would be one of the 50 destroyers selected to be given to the British as part of the Destroyers for Bases deal. The British would commission her as the HMS Lincoln, then lend her to the Norwegians in 1942. She was then loaned again to the Canadians, who would operate this cosmopolitan vessel until 1943 on the North Atlantic convoy routes. In 1944, she would serve in yet another Allied Navy, this time the Soviet, where she was renamed the Druzhny, or Friendly. She would serve with the Russians until the end of the war, after which she would be cannibalized for parts, and eventually sold back to the British for scrapping in 1952, after service in the naval forces of no less than five nations. Turning to gunboats, only some of those serving on the Yangtze patrol at the beginning of the interwar period were of American design. Typical of these were the Monocacy and the Palos, 204-ton shallow draft boats, 165 feet or about 50 meters long, armed with a pair of 57mm 6-pounder Driggs Schroeder Mark II naval guns and six single-mounted 30 caliber machine guns. Both were built and commissioned in 1914. They were built at the Mare Island Navy Yard in Vallejo, California, then disassembled, shipped across the Pacific to Shanghai, reassembled there, and launched onto the river. The gunboats were lightly protected against small arms and machine gun fire, but vulnerable to heavier weapons. She carried 47 men, many of whom would fight with small arms when in action. They were powered by two coal-fired vertical triple expansion steam engines producing 1,600 horsepower, a pair of box-type boilers. The gunboats are capable of 13 knots in good conditions. Their hull shape was boxy and with a wide flat bottom. This made them poor blue water vessels but gave them a very shallow draft, allowing them to operate safely in the shallow waters of the river. The gunboats were not suitable for action against other ships. They were intended instead for action against ground forces, namely the infantry, light artillery, or a regular force likely to be encountered in the vicinity of the river. Against other warships, they suffered from many of the drawbacks of the Civil War era ironclad turret monitors, namely limited mobility, very poor handling in rough seas, and a very low freeboard. Against the kind of threats they were intended to combat, however, they were formidable antagonists. The Monocacy was placed in reserve at Shanghai in June of 1929, when the newer generation of gunboats authorized in 1925 began to arrive on the river. She was put back into service in 1931 to assist in disaster relief operations associated with terrible flooding in August of that year, providing an example of another kind of mission the naval vessels here performed. She continued to serve as a station ship in the various treaty ports in the area thereafter. In 1938, the ship took its only recorded damage from enemy action, when she was hit by fragments from mine explosions near her on Kukang Harbor, where she was operating in defense of U.S. neutrality in the face of Japanese operations there. A year later, the old gunboat was taken out of service for good, towed out to deep water, and sunk there. The generation of gunboats that replaced the Monocacy and her sister, beginning with the USS Guam, were updated models of the same basic design. They were slightly larger, in 350 ton range, with a very shallow draft, and an incremental upgrade in engine power to 1,900 horsepower. The armor and weapons carried were very similar, except for an increase in the anti-aircraft armament and the use of dual-purpose 3-inch guns. The increased firepower could not compensate for the basic vulnerability of these types of crafts to the more dangerous opponents they were encountering on the river, as the fate of the USS Panay, which was sunk by Japanese bombers in 1937, illustrates. The six gunboats built as part of the 1925 authorization would be the final generation to appear on the Yangtze before the Second World War, and some would fight in the Asiatic Fleet's final struggle with the oncoming Japanese in 1942. The interwar period began with U.S. troops still on the Eurasian landmass. Some of these were part of the confused Allied intervention in Siberia, occupying various points along the vital Trans-Siberian Railroad. As the Soviet government began to assert its authority over the region in late 1919, Americans withdrew to Vladivostok in order to leave the country. Local authority in the port city was unable to guarantee order as refugees began to flood in from the west, and two ships from the Asiatic squadron were sent to the city. These were the cruisers Huron, then named the South Dakota, along with the Albany. These vessels assisted in the maintenance of order in the area, as well as the evacuation of American troops forming the intervention force. Far and away the bulk of the Asiatic squadron's activity in the interwar years, however, was focused on China, the ongoing civil conflict created conditions of instability which made constant calls on the American ships. 
The most common job here was the familiar one of protecting river traffic and foreign property against various Chinese groups, most often described as bandits or pirates. The Yangtze patrol force consisted of five gunboats, three of which were antiquated ex-Spanish vessels captured in the 1898 war. In 1921, the World War I destroyer USS Isabel was taken out of reserve, converted into a so-called patrol yacht, and assigned as flagship to the river patrol. Americans on the river made their headquarters at Hankow, but the gunboats were usually spread out along the river's length. Americans cooperated in the performance of their policing duties with the British River Rhine flotilla. The weak government, as well as the endemic civil war, led to lawless and unpredictable conditions that created hazards to Americans there. The year 1923 saw more than the usual instability along the river, especially in the southern reaches. Cite one of the more dangerous examples. The gunboats were sent to the rescue of the passenger steamer Alice Dollar, which was attacked by several hundred men firing from the shore. The approach of the American ships caused the attackers to withdraw. On a more diplomatic end of their job in China, American officers here also negotiated a truce this year between two rival factions that prevented the bombardment of a large, heavily populated town. The river flotilla's ships and men often acted as mediators of countless local conflicts in this way, a function which could hardly have been effective without the implied threat of the gunboats' batteries. After 1923, the banditry and general lawlessness of the country, while still a constant problem, became less important than the consequences of the many-sided civil war raging in the country between Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, Mao Zedong's Red Army, and the many minor warlords. The response of the Yangtze patrol to serious troubles in the year 1923 was considered to have left much to have been desired. Three of the ships, the ex-Spanish vessels Elcano, Villalobos, and Quiros, were old and in poor condition and drew too much water to reach many of the upper portions of the river. Only Benacasi and the Palos proceed far enough up the river to reach all the places where Americans were requesting protection. The placement of at least the three older boats was urged. Six new boats would be authorized in 1925 to replace the Yangtze patrol, and these would begin to enter service two years later, when the first, the USS Guam, was commissioned. The advent of these new gunboats was none too soon, as 1927 would prove to be the most dangerous year so far for the American presence along the river. In this year, attacks on foreign nationals in China became so widespread and severe that the ships of the Asiatic Squadron were supplemented by three additional cruisers and a brigade of Marines 4,000 strong. The principal fighting took place on the 24th of March in Nanking, when anti-foreign rioting accompanied by widespread violence and destruction of property had erupted in response to fighting taking place there. The American ships and troops, along with other foreign contingents and the guns of the assembled ships, which included British, U.S., French, and Italian vessels, held off a Chinese force attempting to attack Sakoni Hill, where the American Consul General, along with hundreds of other Americans and other foreign citizens, were taking refuge. This likely prevented a massacre, and secured the evacuation of these people from the country. The next year was considerably more peaceful, as much of the area involved was captured by the Chinese nationalists, comparatively to little civil disorder, and the fighting had moved on elsewhere. The Marine Force remained in China to deter action against American lives and property, stationed in major cities and detailed to guard American representatives. Sometimes you might find references in works concerned with this period describing these long-service Marines as, quote, old China hands. Orders to withdraw some of these Marines were issued in July, but almost 2,000 would remain in the country. Two landings of regular Asiatic squadron sailors were also made from American ships this year as well. Both of these landings, one in Canton and one at the American missionary outpost at Mekyung, accomplished their missions without the use of force. The activities of the Yangtze patrol continued right up until the beginning of the Pacific War. However, the mission of maintaining Western interests and protecting Westerners and their property against lawlessness here was becoming irrelevant. The conclusion of the Civil War did not bring an end to the endemic disorder along the river, but it did replace the previous antagonists, namely poorly organized groups armed with outdated weapons, with more formidable opponents who were not so easily intimidated. Finally, the entry of the Japanese army and navy into the Chinese arena brought an end to the age of gunboat diplomacy in China forever. The Japanese had been expanding their influence in China and the rest of Northeast Asia since the turn of the century. This followed the familiar pattern of intimidation and extortion that had been employed by the older imperial powers. By the end of the 1920s, Imperial Japan had a considerable sphere of influence in the area, as well as a large military presence. In the early 1930s, this expansion would transition into outright invasion. The occasion was the so-called Mukden Incident in 1931, when an alleged attack on their forces by Chinese troops led to the occupation of Manchuria by the Japanese and their setting up of the puppet state of Manchukuo there. This was not the end of the Japanese invasion, but the beginning. Needless to say, this led to violent anti-Japanese feeling among the Chinese. 
In the city of Shanghai, this hatred would boil over. That time, the city was not entirely under Chinese authority, but that of the international settlement, and was divided into zones administered by the various imperial powers, including Japan. Among the Japanese, there was a sect of rabidly nationalist Buddhist monks, of all things, and these were held in particularly low esteem by the Chinese population. It appears possible that these monks gave some provocation, but provoked or not, some of them were set upon by a Chinese mob in January and murdered. The Japanese in the city retaliated by burning down the Chinese factory from which the mob had issued. Fighting broke out between the two nationalities. A time-honored mechanism of gunboat diplomacy responded to this murder of foreign citizens, but this time it was at the hands of the Japanese, and with much more formidable forces. Before long, Japanese men and ships were pouring into the area. The U.S. Asiatic fleet at this time was, along with its forces in Latin America, the last of the 19th century distant station squadrons still active. It consisted of the heavy cruiser Houston, 19 destroyers, and a dozen submarines. There were also nine river gunboats used on the Yangtze and Pearl Rivers. This is the second largest of the foreign naval squadrons in the area, exceeded only by that of the British, who kept a force built around five cruisers there. It was a slender force to pit against the confident, expanding Japanese empire, including the entire strength of their fleet, which was based not far away. Americans were led by Admiral Montgomery Meigs Taylor. His attitude towards the Japanese and Chinese is significant in understanding his attitude towards the incident. Taylor was not unduly disturbed by Japanese moves in Northeast Asia, including those on China. Like many other informed leaders of his time, he was coming to see the Japanese as an emerging Western-style power. This meant that in his eyes they had become a force of progress and order, with an understandable ambition to expand their power and prosperity. The home islands were poor in most of the resources needed to maintain a vigorous industrial society, and these were present in quantity in Manchuria and northern China. Nothing could be more natural, then, that they would attempt to secure these necessities, and if that meant aggression, the Japanese would be far from the first nation to resort to the use. Taylor also shared the widespread view that the inept leadership and inefficient political and economic organization of the Chinese not only guaranteed their eventual subjection to Japan, but that this inferior system deserved to lose in the struggle for supremacy between nations. The Chinese, he pointed out, spent almost half of their huge national income on defense, yet a comparatively tiny force of Japanese troops were able to defy them with near impunity. The overthrow of such a corrupt and antiquated system was bound to happen sooner or later, it would be no great loss, and would certainly benefit the Chinese people themselves. Thus, when he received his orders to proceed to Shanghai, not only for the routine purpose of protection of Americans there, but also to make a demonstration against Japanese encroachment, he was skeptical not only of the wisdom of the policy, but also of its feasibility. Both he and the State Department leader, Henry Stimson, agreed that no immediate confrontation with the Japanese was desirable. This is illustrated by their reaction in the previous fall to newspaper reports shortly after Mukden that American submarines had moved to Chinese ports in anticipation of war there. Both men took pains to counteract this notion, going well out of their way to emphasize the fact that the movements of these submarines were routine and part of their normal peacetime operation. It was also widely publicized that subsequent movements of American ships and gunboats in that fall, which were also routine, were not war preparations. This was kept up until the end of October 1931, by which time nearly all the American vessels except for the river flotilla had in fact departed Chinese waters. Further, the decision to send ships to Shanghai was not the first choice of the American leadership. Much of the Japanese aggression in China at this time was the work of the Japanese military on the spot, acting in defiance of the wishes of the Japanese government itself. This was the result of one part of the mindset of the Japanese militarist, hypernationalist thinking that was shared by their counterparts among the radicals in the Spanish army at the same time. This was a dangerous perversion of patriotism, whereby high-ranking officers viewed themselves as the only true representatives of the spirit of the nation, the proper guardians of its historical and spiritual patrimony, and the only true interpreters of its interest. This kind of thinking led them to disregard the wishes and the question the legitimacy of civilian governments which they deemed insufficiently aligned with their own agenda of national self-assertion. Stimson misunderstood the nature of this dynamic and placed his hopes in the liberal faction of the Japanese government, which might restrain the military. This proved a false hope, as did his subsequent plan of associating American action with other power through the League of Nations. Unlike Taylor, Stimson felt that the Japanese aggression in China must be resisted to prevent the destabilization of the existing order in Asia. He felt that the conflict would result either in the vast expansion of Japanese power, once she had control of the resources of China, or the rise of a strong militarist China as a result of national reorganization to fight the aggressor. He determined that the Americans must act, even if they did so alone. 
They would not have to act alone, however. Though the British did not share Stimson's ideas about the possible consequences of Japanese aggression, they worried about the potential loss of their lucrative commerce in the area. As a result, a plan for common action was put together, and by late January, the Anglo-Americans began to move to reinforce their people already in the international settlement, who by now were caught up in the middle of rapidly escalating confrontation. The first American ships, four destroyers based at Manila, were ordered by Taylor to head for the embattled city on the 29th. The same day, fighting broke out in the city when the Japanese troops attempted to occupy the Chinese-administered district of Chaipei, where they encountered a large force of Chinese troops. They were pinned down by the Chinese and unable to advance, and in response began a bombardment of the area using bombers and artillery. This action convinced the British, who up until now had held out the hope that the Japanese would restrain themselves, to send the heavy cruiser Kent to the city. As the situation continued to evolve out of hand, with armed Japanese patrols disregarding the boundaries of the national zones of the settlement, threatening to involve the garrisons there in the fighting, another British cruiser, the Berwick, was sent with a battalion of infantry and artillery. Requests for protection from American consular officials and commercial representatives convinced Stimson that the time for action had come, and orders were sent to Taylor to proceed post-haste to Shanghai with the heavy cruiser Houston and his available light forces. A fragile truce had held in the city for the last two days, and with the beginning of February this collapsed. Additional American naval forces were directed to the city, as well as a contingent of 1,000 men from the 31st Infantry Regiment stationed at Manila. At the same time, a joint Anglo-American proposal for mediation of the dispute was presented to the Japanese, worded in the traditional language of protection of commerce, property, and foreign lives. The Houston arrived on the 3rd of February, and the representatives of the American consulate and garrison there came aboard and reported the situation to Taylor. They told him that the Japanese were mainly responsible for the ongoing trouble there, and that their provocative actions both towards the Chinese and the foreign contingents in the city threatened not only to draw the Chinese attack on the city and the American garrison there, but also could result easily in fighting between the Japanese troops and the American Marines. This changed Taylor's estimation of the situation, as he had been hoping to rely on Japanese moderation to resolve the problem. This fundamentally changed his attitude towards the American policy, as it was immediately clear to him that the force they had available was much too small to deter the Japanese. Further, if the Japanese decided to call the Anglo-American Bluff and destroy the ships there, the consequences for the future of the Western powers in China would be disastrous. He therefore adopted a policy of strict neutrality and limited his actions in the area to protest at obvious violations of the truce. This policy of restraint dovetailed well with the attitude of the Japanese in the area, who, despite their aggressive stance, were anxious to avoid international complications due to their overextension. This led to a lessening of the violence in the city and a continuation of the truce, facilitated by the arrival in the city of a new, more senior Japanese commander who took a much less uncompromising attitude towards the Chinese. This easing of tensions was threatened by the arrival of a British commander, Kelly, in the cruiser Kent on February 5th. He took an aggressive tone with the Japanese commander and threatened to open fire on the Japanese aircraft overflying the harbor. Attempts were made by the Allied leaders to effect a resumption of the truce, but it soon became apparent that the peace was probably impossible now that the original truce had been broken. Taylor and Kelly agreed that the best possible outcome would be for the Japanese to drive the Chinese forces away from the city, at which time a peace could more likely be arranged. This is exactly what happened after a Japanese landing up the river from the city forced the withdrawal of the Chinese forces in the area on the 1st of March. This brought the immediate crisis to an end, and the diplomats of the nations involved began meetings in the city to work out the long-term consequences. Taylor felt that this was the appropriate time to remove the American ships and men of the 35th Regiment, and made his recommendation for this action on the 9th. This was refused, and the soldiers were to remain in the city until the end of June, though the ships were withdrawn well before this. Admiral Taylor made it known that he felt the American naval response to the crisis was ineffective. What little influence it had had resulted from diplomatic considerations to which the force represented by the ships was irrelevant. There was little he could have done at Shanghai for the simple reason that while the forces available to him were adequate to act against the Chinese, they were quite useless against the Japanese. The Shanghai incident showed which way the wind was blowing. If the Europeans and Americans wished to retain their influence in the Far East, it was clear that more would be required than squadrons of gunboats backed up by a few cruisers and light forces. The sinking of the gunboat Panay on the river by Japanese planes on December 12, 1937, made it even more obvious that Imperial Japan was not going to be intimidated by the old 19th century methods. So that's where I think I'm going to conclude this episode. I hope you found some of this pretty interesting or useful. I find the story of the American presence in the Far East, 
and of the Asiatic squadron and fleet in particular, very interesting, maybe more so than most American military involvements in the early 20th century. I think it shows the disconnect between the military thinking that was conditioned by the experiences and prejudices of the 19th century with the new military realities that they were attempting to grapple with. In the case of Shanghai, it became very clear that the rules of the game in Asia had changed forever in the days when the situation there could be controlled by a few warships or a few hundred men were over. Next time that we talk about the Americans, we'll return to the Asiatic fleet, detailing its battle to the death with the oncoming Japanese Navy in 1942. But before that, we're going to finish up our look at the Spanish Civil War at sea with the third and final part of that story. So I hope you'll join me for that next Sunday, if not before. I'd also like to mention that I've got a YouTube channel now where I post the video versions of these episodes. They're nothing spectacular, just the audio with a relevant map or a few images for video, but if you prefer to listen to that way, I'll leave a link to the channel in the description of this episode. So that being said, I'd like to thank you again for listening, and until next week, this is Mark7 wishing you all the best.